Thank you. Peter. Uh, so I uh, went to Berkeley in 1979. I was a big fan of Carl Sagan and uh, Stephen Hawking and was going to study astrophysics. And then I took a class from Art Rosenfeld, who many people call the father of energy efficiency. And I've done this for 30 years instead. So uh, I'm going to talk about building energy efficiency in particular commercial buildings. And I think uh, based on my uh, day so far with you folks. I think this is a nice compliment to some of the things you're doing with uh, microgrids. And um, so just in terms of time, should I, should I, we have, how much time? Tell me. We, we have the room until 7. Yeah. Um, normally people will talk for, I don't know, 45 minutes. 45 minutes, yeah. Okay, so I'll try to finish uh, by quarter past or something like that. Okay. And I, I often go over because I, Keep talking, but um, please do ask any questions and, and interrupt me if you have uh, any clarifying questions or technical questions. Well, let's see. Down. So, uh, how many of you have been to Berkeley? Okay. Up above the campus is Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, we were founded by a physicist, Ernest Lawrence. He's sitting right here, um, and they needed space to build these big. Uh, facilities, these particle accelerators. So uh, we were founded in uh, 1931. Uh, 13 Nobel Prizes, we're very proud of those. We're not as proud about all the things we do in my area, except we're proud of Art Rosenfeld. Uh, we, don't, we do have a Nobel Prize related to the uh, climate change work we do. Uh, so we are, I'm a UC employee, uh, and we're managed by the DOE. So we have UC rules and DOE rules, about, about 3,000 people at LBNL. Uh, the area that I work in is called the Energy Technologies Area, and we have, I'm, I'm the head of this division called Building Technology and Urban Systems. This energy analysis and environmental impact, that's where a lot of our international work is, um, and all of the appliance standards work, and then over here is the energy storage and distributed resources, our microgrid work is there. We're very matrix though, so a lot of our projects draw on people across the area. Uh, I have about 120 people in the buildings area, and uh, these one, this is one's a little bigger, and this one's a little smaller. So it's about four or 500 people uh, in this area. So I want to give you a little bit of history about Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and our work in building an energy efficiency. Uh, Art Rosenfeld and a group of others started this work after the oil embargo, uh, and he um, understood that. California was planning to build 40 nuclear power plants at the time. Uh, we, thought there was, we thought that it, energy use was just going to go up and up and up. And after the oil embargo, we started looking at how we use buildings and what we could do as scientists to change the way we use energy. And finding out that how bad our buildings were uh, and, and how leaky they are and how inefficient lights are and things like that. Uh, we started the research program funded by the Department of Energy. And the theme of this slide is that we've gone from, com from widgets, like a ballast or a cool roof, to systems. So now we have things like Energy Plus for whole building simulation. We have Plex Lab, I'll talk a little about, um, and even urban science. So we're going from widgets to systems 
to whole buildings to maybe cities and, and microgrids. So, so as we move from studying a window to studying a system, there's a lot of complexity, and we'll talk about some of that. This is the building, the scope of what we do in the buildings area. At the top, you'll see we do work in technology. We do electronic sliding and networks, um, windows and envelope materials and simulation. Uh, one of the real exciting areas, which I'm going to talk about today, is the idea that simulation has historically been a design tool. You design a building, but we actually want to use simulation for control and operations. And that's a major theme of what we do, is that uh, we can figure out what windows to put in, how much insulation to put in the walls, how much energy that might save. But as we move from simple, flat energy costs to really dynamic tariffs and storage and PV, uh, we need much more dynamic controls. And that's one of the challenges. How do we do that? Uh, we, we have groups that focus on buildings, commercial buildings, residential buildings, high tech and industrial, and sustainable federal operations. So we work with DOD and GSA. And we do a lot of work in data centers. So that that's, gives you an overview of the kinds of things we do. Uh, this, this building here is kind of cool. It's a, um, have, any, have you seen this before, this building here? It's in San Francisco. It's a, some people call it the bird cage. So it's, it's the largest passively ventilated office building in the United States. So it's, you'll see these in Europe. And it actually has passive cooling and ventilation. And it's got. Uh, uh, convection currents coming through it to try to cool it um, so it has no vapor compression cooling and I know some people inside that it had terrible glare problems so they didn't design it very well it's, it's in San Francisco near Civic Center it's a federal building it was very difficult to build it's not operating particularly well they're not they're not um, sharing a lot of the data they're actually being very closed about it uh, and I know that they they built desks that were with high uh, cubicle walls, and it, and it really killed all the daylight and penetration. And they were, they were, people had umbrellas because of the glare, like they would put an umbrella in their office place. So we build buildings to do things. Go ahead. It's a, that's a, um, like a, I think this is a, like a viewing facade, like an atrium in the middle. Do you know, Waylon? Have you been in it? What do you think of it? They tried. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I was I was telling these, uh, Peter about is in Europe, it's Ill, in Sweden everybody has a window. So these shallow plan buildings where there's daylight is is uh, European. Americans make these big core buildings, and in the middle there's no light, uh, and there's you have to heat and cool it. So it, these European these are much more common in Europe. But this is a pretty tall one, and it's got a variety of problems. They tried. Uh, okay, it's the building sector. The building sector is complex, and this slide is about that complexity. So 40% of the total energy use in the United States is from buildings, and 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So right there is where we say, okay, I care about it. It's actually the largest sector. It's larger in energy use than transportation or industry. So of all the sectors, uh, it is the largest sector. 76% of the electric use is Buildings. So the grid is about buildings. Um, that's going to change as we have more EVs and about $400 billion a year we spend heating and cooling and lighting our buildings. And those are big numbers. So those are numbers that we care about. But what, what do we do about them? Because we have all these different kinds of buildings, grocery stores and manufactured housing and different climates. And then down here, all the end uses, uh, ventilation, washers and dryers, lighting, thermostats. So it's a complex area because it's got all these different services that we're trying to make more efficient. And as the theme of my talk is, we also have to integrate their control. Now this slide is about problems in buildings. And up on the upper, up your left here, uh, this, these graphics here are from, this is energy use, but this is 1.0. And this is uh, Buildings that have gone through tune-ups or retro-commissioning processes. And buildings have problems, so professional engineers go in and fix them. What happens, though, is that when they leave, the energy use starts to creep up again. So we can fix the building, and then it starts to creep up. And this is just an example of what some of those profiles look like. 
So we know we can tune up a building like we tune up a car, get it working more efficiently, but we're not good at sustaining performance and having that performance persist. That's a huge issue. We have leaks and windows. We have infrared scans. We have a lot of cycling of controls. Every building, most buildings, go ahead. Well, is facilities behavior or facilities O&M? You know, sort of behavior of the facilities people. So sometimes you'll automate something and they'll defeat it because they had a hot cold call somewhere and then they'll override something that was intended. So, so it's, a, it's a little of both. And uh, facade damage, it's amazing to see uh, what we see in facades, but controls, lighting, all kinds of problems are very prevalent in, in buildings. So I've been working on this topic for a long time. And in 1993, uh, we picked um, 160 Sansom, this building here in San Francisco. This was funded by um, the California Energy Commission. This is a before and after study. But uh, at, the site, at the site, we were using an ISDN line that cost us about $5,000 a year. We had a silicon graphics workstation. And we worked with a guy named Lee Englock, who um, Amory Levin said is the world's greatest HVAC engineer. So the philosophy of this project was we picked Fred Smothers to study. We didn't pick the building. We picked Fred. And we, the idea was if we had an information system that presented data in a way that was useful to Fred, we could figure out if it would be useful to other people. So the theory was innovation adoption. You pick an early adopter. And we did extensive submetering. We did all the towers and pumps and chillers. Uh, we did whole building. We had a remote web browser. Supersymmetry was the name of Lee Englock's company. Uh, Peter Rumsey used to work there. Uh, and we demonstrated that this technology was useful to Fred. What he actually found, the main thing was they had to retrofit the controls. So we couldn't even program the controls to do what he wanted to do. And we had all kinds of hunting. This is, this is sort of the, that cycling before and after. So the concept of providing information to operators is, a, is something we've known for decades. Um, the challenge is how to make it actionable. Because there's all kinds of tools these days where people are using the internet and getting data. At the time, the internet was expensive. Now we can do that. So, so as we move forward into the future, our ability to get the data and show it to somebody is super important. Then we have to say, what are they supposed to do with that data? That's much harder. Uh, but we'll show some examples of that. Uh, We've been doing related things. So this commissioning research uh, is, is part of what I'm doing. And this 160 Sansom is right here. So we were doing what I call energy information systems research. So we've been doing that for quite some time. 160 Sansom, uh, a web-based information systems, case studies at Santa Barbara. The case study at Santa Barbara with Jim Dewey, um, they put in a system. It was a silicon energy, energy management system, energy information system. And we showed that they could save a lot of money by finding out which buildings had the fans on all night. So common. So they would look at a load shape and then change it. And that actually is where monitoring-based commissioning came from. And MBCX is sort of a thing these days. Uh, and it came from these kinds of pilots where uh, with the MBS, MBCX uh, cost-benefit study was done in, the, in 2007. So we're moving into the future. Um, and I'm going to give you an idea of where some of these things are going. Uh, commissioning research, how do you do a functional test? Functional tests are typically things you do a one-time test. So we talked a little about design intent earlier today. This is about deciding what a system is supposed to do. How do you define a test? Then how do you measure it over time to make sure the savings are persisting? And then benchmarking. Benchmarking is the idea that um, if you compare your building to another one, uh, you want to account for all the things. Is, you wouldn't care, you compare a building uh, of auditoriums with a building with just classrooms, because they may be quite different in the kinds of things, or a, or a laboratory building and a, uh, a gymnasium. So you want to benchmark with more similar buildings. EPA has a benchmarking tool. But comparing buildings between Alaska and Hawaii is a little bit strange. It's better if you could compare buildings, all the UC campuses or CSU campuses, and have a cohort that's more similar to yours. So here's where we're headed. We've been doing 
PID loops, which is a proportional control. We tune PID loops. PID loops are always a problem in buildings because you, you're, you're setting the PID, PID loop a certain way and, and there's a lot of hunting that goes on. Model predictive control for large buildings. I'll, I'll tell, talk a little about that. And then adaptive grid aware MPC for buildings and communities. So we're, we're moving towards a time where you care about a microgrid. You care about a system of buildings. You care about the local distribution system. Um, and you want to be able to manage the costs, integrate with the grid, conduct fault diagnostics. So these models provide FDD capabilities and respond to people. That's something we want to do as well. We want to know, are the people comfortable? And how is the space? So this is a project we're doing that's a US-China collaboration. Uh, Johnson Controls is our main partner here. We also have Disney and United Technologies that produces automated logic controls. So this particular system is taking building system performance data and occupant behavior data, developing a system of models, and providing optimized performance and user feedback. We're considering grid signals, and we're definitely me measuring the weather. And I'll talk about this system in more detail. <coughs> so this is basically a hierarchical occupancy responsive system. Uh, the, the main site uh, was going to be Milwaukee. We're now looking for a site because after a full year of work with Johnson Controls, they've decided the intellectual property that we're developing is too close to what they're patenting right now. So we're looking for a site, if you know one that you might want. Maybe you guys have one. Um, uh, so this is, we do open source code, and they don't want any IP bleed uh, in their project and collaboration, but they're very supportive of this because they believe that the next generation, Johnson Controls is actually saying, historically, they control the building for comfort, and the future, the building control systems have to manage energy. We call them energy management systems. We pay our bills once a month. They don't actually measure energy. So the good news is we're figuring out an energy management system should measure energy, because if you don't measure it, how are you going to manage it? So basic thing is whole building power, but we're going a lot deeper. And I'll, I'll show you some examples. <laughs> so this is, uh, we believe that this is about 20% savings. When you run a building with these kinds of controls, you could save about 20%. And that's worth about 1.9 quads in the US, or a quad in China. <clears throat> so about $6 billion. I mentioned that $400 billion a year, that earlier number about the, the savings in the United States. Uh, the, the, ener the, how much we pay for energy in buildings in the United States is about $400 billion. billion. We think we can save about $6 billion with this kind of technology. Um, we also can manage the peak demand. So if we, if we are tracking the whole building electric use, we can manage that. And we have these added benefits of, of grid integration. We'll talk a little about that as well. And so this was going to be our site. Um, and as of this week, uh, it's not. That's the way it goes. OK, this is to give you some technical information into model predictive control. Uh, I know it's a complex slide, but uh, the main thing I want you to get excited about is the fact that these things are coming to the building sector. Uh, this model-driven, uh, data-driven model identification to reset and calibrate reduces model setup, calibration, and maintenance. So, so as we develop the models, uh, I'll talk about one of the sites we did at the Navy, Naval Academy and, and some of our issues in calibrating the models. But we really need to, to as we develop these kinds of models, to, to be able to calibrate them. This hierarchical MPC. I mentioned that we're going to include occupants, um, modeling, and optimization. So we, we have uh, optimization solvers as part of these methods. And we're trying to, so, so basically the idea is you develop these models, you look at the price of energy, you look at the weather forecast, you look at who's in the building, and then you tell it what the set points should be. So you're actually doing set point analysis. <coughs> I'll show you some of that. I'll show you some of that. Um, occupant integration. So we actually have a uh, IA annex that's doing occupant modeling. And, and so you know, if you have an Energy Plus model or a building simulation, we're trying to actually co collect data to model how people respond in buildings. So, so I'll, I'll talk a little about that too. 
And then uh, this is all open source code. When, so the National Labs right now, we're being asked to produce open source tools. And that means that they're available for anybody to use. There's no fee for them. Uh, there's a very open community. And we're trying to make these available for others to use. So over here, uh, we have the Enterprise Energy Manager. One of the exciting things about these kinds of projects is who is the audience for the information? Is it the facility guys in the boiler room? Or is it the CFO that wants to know is the building running efficiently? So there's multiple screens for these kinds of things. Um, and we're modeling occupant comfort. We, we may actually work with the building robotics and the, and the building comfy app, which is an iPhone app where people uh, that Johnson Controls is sponsoring where people can actually say if they're comfortable or not. So there's a variety of ways you can do the kind of occupant monitoring. And uh, this hierarchical system, in this particular site, we're doing zone level MPC, building level MPC, and campus level. So we're actually trying to develop, this is mostly a proof of concept. Uh, and and uh, Johnson Controls is starting to look at the business models for bringing these things to the building sector. So this is a huge opportunity as we uh, bring the new technology to buildings. And then this is the, um, the, uh, what the models look like. I'll show you a little bit more about that. Uh, and we, when you build the models, you have the computer algebra to run the optimization code and put these things together in a way that they can converge. <coughs> so uh, this is a little bit about how the MPC works. Um, the basic concept is we have what's called uh, adaptive action models and occupant models to predict how people are using a space. So here, the adaptive action models, we're actually thinking about how they interact with the, the, the controls, the lights, the switches, the windows. Uh, so we would, we would actually model uh, their behavior and how they interact with things. And then this here is where are they, how long are they in the building, who's arriving first, who's leaving. So scheduling people in the building. This is an important piece of a model that historically we haven't measured these things. So in this MPC methodology, a lot of attention is being given to how we actually uh, model the people and predict what they're doing. And we, we actually uh, integrate these with the MPC system and then validate the model against the way their behavior is. Um, so that's, does that answer your question? A little bit. Looks hard. Yeah. It's, re it's a research project. But it, you know, it gives you an idea of what's to come. It, 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 I think that's an important thing is that the research projects we did, the one I showed you in 1993, is nothing like this. So imagine what it's going to be 20 years from now. It's really important to keep asking that question, especially with everybody carrying an iPhone. You can actually interact in very new ways. So we're only beginning to skim the surface on how we use the Internet of Things to manage energy. So this is a, a look at the, the way the model is structured. And this is just to give you an idea of the pieces. We have here the exo data, the grid signals, the weather data, the systems, occupancy, HVAC systems, the models, uh, simulation, validation, estimation, and optimization of grid services, costs, and energy. So it's, there's a lot of complexity here. This is a, um, a, uh, an effort to bring multiple parties together that are doing different pieces of the modeling and put it into one sort of system. So this is this J Modelica. Uh, the Modelica platform from, from Europe is the uh, primary uh, tool that we're using, but also this estimation pie. And Modelica Buildings Library from what's called Annex 60. So we are developing the modules and putting them together in, in scripting, uh, developing the architecture and the optimization systems. Uh, DOE is really excited about this. It's, it's Greek to a lot of people, but I, I assure you, this is the future in buildings. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna, now I'm going to move to another site where we've been doing this for a while. So I have um, got you thinking about uh, what a very complex system looks like. This one's much simpler. It's doing a much simpler piece of the puzzle. Maybe I should have done this one first. Uh, but the graphics aren't as nice. Uh, and this is the Naval Academy, uh, where my dad went to school. These are the two chiller plants. 
It's a, it's a, it's a military campus. It's a, it's a uh, research campus as well. Um, we are only dealing with the cooling towers and the chillers here, and we're doing some model predictive control as well as fault diagnostics. And the purpose of this project is to explore that same Modelica framework and its use in managing a complex cooling plant. We started at the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C., so this, is, this project's been going on almost five years. And we were, we were at a site where we were having a lot of challenges with the facility manager to get the data out of the chillers. They were trained chillers. We had a Metasys platform. Um, we, there was a shooting at the Navy Yard, you may remember, years ago. And that was actually the building we were at. So we had to move to another site, which is, I've been through this before, where you have to move sites. Uh, we landed here, and they were phenomenal to work with and actually had most of the sensors already in a newer chiller plant. So it was a, it was a fortuitous move for us. So here, um, we're monitoring the chill water supply and return uh, to these two different cooling plants. The plants have different numbers of chillers and, and towers, Lejeune and Rickover. And this is what a Modelica model looks like. So this is the actual, um, the, the, what Modelica does is when you draw a picture like this, it configures the equations. So it's got this graphical user interface. Uh, and and this, is, uh, this is what the language of the model looks like. And it turns this into a set of equations that become the system that you're solving. So we, take, we create this based on the piping and, the, and the, uh, the drawings and the specs for the chillers and the towers. Um, and then, and then we, we calibrated it with the plant data. So, so we, we, we're modeling the, the way they run the chillers. And, and I'll, I'll show you some of that in more detail. So these are the main things that we focused on. Chiller efficiency. So we looked at the KW per ton versus ton curves. In order to see, chillers often, when they're loaded really low, uh, they're poor performance. And when they're loaded high, they're more efficient. So you don't want to bring on the next chiller until you've really loaded one up. And there's five chillers here. So we spent a lot of time on the chiller dispatch, trying to figure out how to ride up and down those curves. So that's part of what we did. Um, and we were using, Mike Sohn did this work with this Bayesian nonlinear state estimation, clustering, and decision tree. I'll show you some of those examples. Um, <clears throat> the chiller and uh, tower cycling, time-based data analysis, purely data-driven, and then the condenser water, chiller tower pump system model predicted to look at the energy consumption, uh, look at the condenser water set points, and then we solved the optimization function from the literature. So, so we collected all this stuff here. Uh, the, the, we didn't have to install much, which, which was, new. It was, a, it was a fairly new plant. We were able to get the data out. Often in these kinds of projects, you spend a lot of time just getting the time series data out of the controls. Um, we had a, we had to, although, although we had two different vendors, uh, IBM and Energy ICT, uh, before we, we, both of them failed to deliver, and we had, actually had to build all the stuff in-house. So that might sound familiar. You know, it's sort of, that's the reality of this stuff, is that um, sometimes you just got to own it and figure out how to do it. So we had an operator kiosk. Uh, which I'll show you some of this. And then over here is, are the models. So, so we have a, uh, uh, whoops, did that the wrong way, wrong button. We have the fault diagnostics algorithms and then the plant insight tool. This is where all the data live with the models and then this is um, looking at how to present the data and a graphical user interface, which I'm gonna show you. <coughs> so this is where we're at. Then the sequence that we went through, looking at the needs, installing the hardware, developing the baseline. So um, we're finishing next summer, and we promised 10% cooling savings. So we've created the baseline data over several years. Um, we, we, we should be ready to, for them to use this. So this is what we call man in the middle system. It's not fully automated. We make recommendations of set points to them. And then they implement them. So there was a lot of discussion with them about would they act on the information we gave them. That was a key part of what we were doing. So we had beta test the diagnostics, integrated the model, and we're doing the on-site evaluation 
um, now. So we're, it's up and running, getting, getting warmer. And then, and then the tech transfer plan, again, these are open source tools, so we'll be looking for uh, vendor partners to commercialize it. So this is what some of the data look like. I mentioned uh, kW per ton versus tons or part load ratio. You can see that the chillers, this is 0.5 and this is 0.9. So you really want the chillers to be running up here. I'm not sure what this data is here, but you can see the measured and the simulated. So the green is the simulated and the, and the blue is the measured. Not bad. Um, we've spent a lot of time on this piece of it. Um, here is kW per ton simulated um, versus kW per ton measured. So we defined, and this is um, 0.5 here, and this is uh, 0.8. Uh, so we defined kind of a goodness of fit for the model calibration, and we've collected data over several summers. <clears throat> so this Chiller 2 model calibration, an R squared of 0.8, 1% of the data are beyond the 10% error. So that, that's what we were looking for to show that we calibrated the model to the historical data, and then we could use the models to do the control. So it says three of six chiller, chillers calibrated within 10%. The other three weren't. So, so we've actually not fully succeeded with all the chillers. Remaining chillers will require more data to develop a meaningful fit. Uh, we had all kinds of data problems. Um, getting the data, missing data, uh, mirroring the data set, get it, it just years of problems, but you're supposed to be excited about our results, not our problems, so I'll show you. So uh, now I'm showing you some of the screens about um, what the progress, this is the dashboard. Um, what's exciting is we're putting energy not just into kilowatt hours, but into dollars. So we're giving them something to look at, and they really like it. That's the thing I feel really good about, is they like it, and they're saying good things to DOD. That's, that's success. If a facility manager doesn't say, go away, you're a pain, they say, no, this is actually useful. We want to give them the tools so they can do their jobs. Um, and uh, That's total cost. Yeah, so... so um, I, may, I may have some examples, I, I'm not sure. I know we do efficiency faults, so some things we quantify. Some of the cycling, so let, let me see what I got here. Um, but this is, this is uh, a, a particular day. No, this is, this is over, this must be over a week, I think. These are days. So, so this is uh, the, the chill water loop and, and Lejeune. But, but the fact that we're just showing them how many dollars are being used, they don't have that. That's the point. Uh, this is a, a plot of the, that plant efficiency that I showed. This is the tower tons versus kW per ton. Um, this is a, here, the tower, you want to get the condensing temperature as, as low as possible, the, the condensing water temperature, uh, because that makes the chillers more efficient. So if you can use the fans on the tower as much as possible, uh, but there's limits to what you could do, and, and we were just running up against that. This is the total load and the outside temperature. And this is actually, uh, the dashboard presents plant efficiency and next day load forecasts. So the load forecasts give us an idea of which chillers we need to dispatch. So the total load is, is this amount here, and, and uh, uh, this, is, this is a projection into the, into the future. Now, um, this here shows you the tower cycling faults. And and here is kW uh, versus time. And you can see here all this cycling. And, and this one here is one of the problems. So we have Rickover and Lejeune tower fan cycling. And we have a, a potential, this says potential energy savings, 21 kilowatt hours, potential costs uh, $267. So that's, that's just for that particular day, I'm pretty sure. So, so this is an example of um, a fault detection on the towers. Uh, this is set point optimization. Uh, the actual power in red here, and if they optimized it, that's the amount of savings. So here we're at about, about 2,200 uh, kilowatts, and we could save about 20, about a couple, maybe 100 kilowatts 
um, from running it better. Up here in the, the blue is the set point, optimal set point, and the actual set point. In this case, we're suggesting they, they let it warm up. Um, and this is examples of the savings they'll get for running the tower differently. And then this is an efficiency fault. Uh, the previous version of the tool showed efficiency faults on a time series basis, and below will show faults aggregated into regimes to aid diagnostics. So, so this is showing you 1,600 kilowatts of waste over this period. Uh, and the, this is the measured COP and the expected COP, so it runs the model continuously, and it gives them an idea of whether the overall system is running as, as good as it can. So they don't tell them what set points to implement to try to achieve those savings. Now, um, so that's my last slide on the MPC. Now I'm going to sort of broaden into some other themes. Uh, one of the areas that we're working on is with cities. And there's two ideas here. Uh, our goal is to try to reduce cities by 50%. So that's the common goal for buildings is people say, can we cut energy use in half? Um, one of the things we're trying to do is to develop tools to simulate entire cities. And we're using something called CityGML. This is uh, what a CityGML data standard looks like. The city of Berlin is available in the CityGML format. So you can see the buildings, where they're located, how big they are, where the windows are, if, where the parks are, where the streets are. If you have those kinds of tools, um, then we can start to use energy models and look at which retrofits are appropriate. If you think about something like an urban heat island and you want to project into the future, as climate gets warmer, uh, how hot is it going to get in the buildings? What if you do uh, uh, cool roofs or cool pavements and, and what's going to happen to the parks and to the water? So you can think about the modeling agenda for cities and if cities invested today in, say, a cool roof retrofits, how might that actually help the city in the future? Um, there's a lot of work on uh, shading. So we actually shade the buildings as we model all of them. And maybe you put PV on them and see what, how does that compare to changing the cool roofs. So we're doing these scaled models um, in order to try to help cities understand the policy opportunities. The second one here is bi-directional low energy heating and cooling. And this is also a Medelica based activity <coughs> where we're looking at very uh, efficient district heating and cooling systems. Um, and these may be water coupled or bay coupled or ground coupled. And instead of hot water or steam, we're, we're actually sending ambient temperatures around. And, the, and these systems actually change directions. They can change directions from heating to cooling and the flow actually changes. So, so that's an area where we believe in the long term some of the most efficient uh, HVACs will be these district systems that take the wastewater uh, heat exchangers or ground coupling. And the example I like to use in, in Seattle, the new Amazon building is using heat from the data center next door and it's not their data center. They're buying heat from a data center. So it's a 20 year contract and there's heat exchangers in the basement, and they're buying heat from a neighbor because the neighbor has too much waste heat. So when two buildings together use less than one would individually, these kinds of systems make sense. And, but it does, it's, again, it's this integration theme where the buildings are, uh, one building may be heating, another cooling, put them together, and they're much more efficient as a system. Uh, now I'm going to show you a couple of graphs from uh, Peter's work with me and, and a big team. Uh, as we uh, think about what these model predictive control systems need to do, we also think about um, the new grid integration challenges. The grid was built to supply energy to buildings. And we historically, we just build more power plants, and we're at a time where we're trying to have more renewables on the grid. So as we have more renewables on the grid, we need more flexible buildings. And one of the ways to get that flexibility is to model it. So the building needs to know what can it tell, what can it tell the grid I can do? What resources are available from the building? Do I have a battery? Do I have thermal storage? Um, do I have a, a facade system that I can close the windows and, and reduce the lights? 
Uh, so we have these services, shed and shift, shedding for the peak hours, shifting, using more in the middle of the day to um, soak up the renewable energy. Uh, we also have new prices where the lowest prices could be in the middle of the day. So when we build a system, we don't necessarily know what the prices are going to be in the future. But if we build these models, we can help run it better. So, so today, we, we, again, we run a building and we pay the bill, and we actually don't manage the energy. That's the most important thing. We need to manage the energy. Uh, this is our shimmy service, uh, where uh, on five minute ahead or frequency control, we're actually, the loads are actually responding to grid signals. And uh, we may be do, able to do that with VFDs. We've actually demonstrated that in some of our research. Could you, could you provide ventilation as well as provide some regulation services to the grid? So it's, a, it's complex, but we have to figure it out. I mean, it's, it's an urgent thing. So this is uh, a little bit of what I've just told you in a, in a little bit of different way of looking at it. We're, we're in a time when we have, dynamic, we have dynamic facade systems. We have dynamic windows. We have dynamic shades. We have controllable lights. We have HVAC systems that we can pre-cool or we can change the ventilation set points. We get utility signals. Um, a lot of these systems, which, which I showed you just a little bit, was can, can these data for the facility manager also be used for fault diagnostics? Can, can, can would the facility manager use the data to figure out, is it time to change a filter? Uh, is, the, is there an air leak somewhere? Uh, is the economizer working? Uh, fault diagnostics, photovoltaics, and storage are becoming part of this. And we're interacting directly with the grid operators. So, so the c concept is to have a grid responsive building, we need an integrated interoperable s a system, and we have to have c continuous efficiency analysis. We, we don't have that today, but we need it, and we're trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, this is a similar picture. As I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, we started with static energy efficiency, a better light bulb, a better window. We're now in a dynamic, very dynamic world. So the more we measure these end use loads and try to integrate them as a whole, uh, we need to consider, again, how are the people in the building? We, this will be part of the building of the future, is measuring uh, their health effects, measuring productivity, measuring uh, security. Who's in the building? Where are they? Integrating with the EVs. That's, that's really, that's coming. We don't know how to do it yet. What's that going to make the electric load look like on the building meter? Something to think about. And then, again, is it a microgrid? Is it the larger grid? Or some sort of campus that we're integrating as a system? So these things we're all doing today, miscellaneous equipment, dynamic envelope, uh, advanced lighting, building automation. So we have these responsive loads. We do not control them as a system yet. And I think. Uh, Flex Lab, this is uh, what I've told some of you about. Uh, this is, please come and visit our Flex Lab. Uh, this is the, the test beds. Um, these are the, the three static ones. This one actually rotates. Um, our first test was Genentech, uh, and this is the Genentech windows. They had phase change material in the floors. They were testing the lighting control, and they were testing these, the design of these awning systems to see what it was like inside. They put in all their desks. We had a variety of cameras and things. And we were studying what the indoor environment was like. And we pre-commissioned the control system for the lighting control and the facade automation. I hope none of those grad students were <laughs> <laughs> We named these all Peter. They're all named Peter. <laughs> uh, no, we thought about giving them DOE names. Um, we're actually, this, this month, for the first time, putting people in Flex Lab, grad students probably. Um, but, but these are pretty cool. These are from the Center for the Built Environment at UC Berkeley. They have heat tape on them. So, so we, we, we can, this picture doesn't show it, but we have CFD. Uh, well, we have fluid IR cameras that show you the plume that comes off the person. So, so we can test something called um, uh, demand control ventilation, where uh, it's stratified. Let's see if any of these pictures show. OK, here. These are temperatures at different parts of the room, and the big-ass fan. And everybody you know what a big-ass fan is? There's a big-ass fan. Uh, 
Big S Fan is an amazing brand of fans. Uh, it's ironic, the, the heating and cooling industry, ASHRAE and such, actually doesn't have good specs on fans like, as a performance enhancement. So as we go towards mixed mode passive buildings and we add fans, there's a lot of research to do about, about their role and comfort. But we know people are more comfortable if the air's moving. Uh, so we are doing some comfort studies. The Center for Built Environment is using one of the cells. Um, up here, these are our Tesla batteries I told you guys that were getting installed. This is the container we were going to build to put them in, but we actually had to put them in. This was so expensive, we had to put them in one of our cells. So we've lost a cell. Um, the cells are uh, different vintages. We have a 1980s cell, so 1980s code, older lights, older windows, older, older, older value in the walls. We can change the heating or the cooling. We have radiant heating and cooling in the floors. We have both air and hydronic HVAC systems. Um, anything in gray here, this gray, can all be changed out to windows or different wall configurations. Uh, we're testing some phase change materials. So it's designed to test component as well as, as a system. So we can test lights, HVAC, plug loads as an integrated system. Um, so that's FlexLab. And then I have this last slide. So this theme of responsive buildings, uh, today, these systems are separate. The facade, the HVAC, the lining and equipment. Um, we need to know if, what the people experience is in the building. We need to know what the grid is doing. We need to know the outside temperature. So this new layer is, is what we're proposing. These integrated operating systems, model-driven control, and pervasive monitoring. Those are pieces that we don't have today. And we're, we know this is the future. There's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, and we look forward to collaborating with you guys and figuring this out. So I think this is my, yeah, my last slot. Um, I feel this is urgent need to accelerate our work. So it's great to be here today. Uh, the, this is a complex space, and it's going to require a lot of collaboration. So, so no group is going to solve this. This is, gonna, is, this, is a collaboration between research and industry and business models for the utilities. Um, energy efficiency and grid responsiveness are critical. There's a lot of work needed on business models. And there's a lot of work in education, so I thank you for your role because Educating people to grasp these kinds of systems and participate in getting them to work is, is very important. Thanks. Please. I, I had a question about the, the thing about district energy systems quickly and, mm -hmm. and sending water loops around into neutral. Yep. Uh, yep, that's right. All electric. Right. Yep. Yeah, and so and integrals. Universal sink for most heating and cooling. That's right. Share. That's right. And and it, you know, in the California climate, it may not be needed because you could have have a local heat pump. It's it, for for a for a colder climate or a hotter climate, it's actually more cost effective. So so because we can do so much with just passive ventilation, passive cooling. It depends on the campus scale and what the loads are at the campus level. But we're, you know, Richmond campus is looking at this, uh, the new UC campus at Richmond, and Integral Group is designing some of these. And then um, UC Davis is trying to do some of this. So we're trying to understand the tools to model it and what the energy savings potential are. I imagine it makes a lot of sense when you have balanced loads. So exactly. Because you're just like the example you did. Yeah. Be sharing someone else's exactly. If you have a, a hospital and some single family homes, I mean, th there's ideal combinations. And, and so how far, when you start moving from that ideal, where does it make sense? That's, that's a good question. Any other questions? Go ahead to your first. You said that Johnson Controls is pulling out of the study. Yeah. Not in the study of the, they, they can't, they can't give us their building. They, they still want to participate in the study, but they can't participate as actively as they had hoped because of intellectual property. What criteria are you looking for? For a building? Uh, a building with a variable air volume system, an office building would be ideal. So we're looking for uh, 
a control system where we can get the data out, and, and we would have to install extra submetering. They were going to pay for that, um, but it would be kind of a, an office building, BAB. What do you think of the, um, <clears throat> the variable refrigerant flow systems like the yeah like the, the Daikin yeah or the fishing the yeah city multi I have really mixed feelings about them I I I'm not a fan of leaking refrigerant I've heard that that's a big problem because they're you know they're ex they're tube they're plastic tubing I think some sort of PVC or well, I've seen is copper right? copper yeah I mean, it's, copper's expensive too mm -hmm. um, I mean in terms of zoning absolutely. You know, but so they will come. We actually been we get some funding from Daikin, and I think uh, they actually had one project in Livermore that they did a demand response test, and so they're very, they're so good at zoning. You know, uh, I, I, I I hadn't heard about copper. Yeah, there's one in Eureka at the the GHD where they have a, a Mitsubishi City Multi system yeah. that that's all copper flown. And yeah, so it's like it's got kind of, uh, fifteen fan coils. Like yeah. I think I think in general they're quite promising. And that, that's the most common concern I always hear. Also, the refrigerant. The refrigerant, not necessarily because of the tubing, but just because there's a large refrigerant volume, larger than like split systems, because it serves the entire building. Yeah. And it goes everywhere. Yeah. So there's a lot of chances to potentially leak. have a leak, yeah. and then it all dumps in one room. Yeah. So yeah. So if they could, risks. and so it's a really install quality problem. So it's, you know, we always are challenging our trades to do this stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, so new buildings are one thing, uh -huh. but we have this huge stock of existing buildings. Uh -huh. Are we at the point where we can say very much about this, uh, the, the economics of retrofitting this kind? Yeah. An aging building is, it makes more sense now than another building type? Yeah. You know, in general, um, new buildings are easier, right, to get to be energy efficient. And, and the big challenge is the retrofit agenda. Um, I, I, I spoke mostly about controls and model predictive control, and that is ripe for retrofits, you know, because the control systems that are there now are not doing what they need to do. Exactly how, do you have to also retrofit the HVAC? That's expensive. But in general, the simple answer is yes. That and 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 it, so one of the things we're thinking about is is ESCO models, where there's a third party that finances it. Uh, we're actually using the term guaranteed performance to try to uh, minimize the risk and quantify the risk with efficiency investments, so that the uncertainty is managed in a portfolio. Uh, so an individual building may be more or less uh, performing, but the portfolio needs to. And, and so actually improving the data. We recently did a study with commercial mortgages, first time ever. So with residential mortgages, it's been shown that if you invest in energy efficiency, in general, a more efficient building doesn't have as much defaults on mortgages, but we've just shown that's true in commercial as well. So if you can get financiers to value efficiency investments, you, know, you basically you wanna put, find places in society where you can value efficiency investments and, and commercial mortgages. Uh, will default less if there's efficiency investments. So do you start like in small towns and work your way up, or would it start out like a big city? I don't think that matters. I mean, it, it's interesting because we are starting to do work in cities. The, the good thing, cities know their local buildings. They know the owners. They know the you know who's who, which are commercial, which are private, or public, and uh, I think you need to start everywhere. So. So uh, a lot of new buildings are being built in developing countries like India, yep. China, yep. Indonesia. Like you said, one of the most biggest challenges you faced is finding the right data yep. right for the model. Yep. Uh, finding data in developing countries is much harder. Yep. It's really be more hard. So to achieve speed and scale, how do you think this research will help you know, establish some kind of protocols or something so that you get data easily in those countries and kind of apply this research over there? Yeah, so actually that. That MPC example that I started with, that was a US-China collaborative, and we are working with Disney in Shanghai. Uh, and United, so Johnson Controls wants to sell this stuff in China. So China has been, we also have a US-India program. So, so we, I work on both. 
Um, the Chinese are, as you probably know, if we figure something out, the government can require it. So, so they actually have almost more um, authority to require things. That doesn't mean they work. One of the ironies I've heard about uh, Chinese buildings is they'll put in a Johnson Controls or a Honeywell system, and then they'll manually control it. Because labor's so cheap, they'll, they'll have a person in front of the terminal instead of automating it all, which is going to be really a problem with demand response if we tried to automate a DR event. There's people. So in India, India is, of course, um, very IT savvy, and and the you know the one of the ideas is to leapfrog the U.S., not build as many stupid buildings, and and so India would actually be a great place. We are doing MPC. Infosys has been a phenomenal partner. So 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 Infosys um, is investing in uh, uh, passive cooling. Um, we know the comfort ranges in India are quite different. Uh, those big ass fans are more common. Uh, so, so a lot of this is cultural. What will work in India may be much more efficient than what works here because expectations are different. And dress codes, you know, you have to get people out of suits. And, <laughs> and so that's a, there's, a, there's definitely a behavior piece here. And um, resiliency also is an opportunity. But, but behavior and economics are important pieces. Other questions? So how much are you uh, incorporating occupancy into your modeling? You take little bits and pieces of it. Yeah. So, um, so uh, there's a re researcher named Tianzhen Hong that leads the occupant modeling work. And what he's been doing is creating a, a framework for how you represent people in energy plus models, so in, in building energy simulations. Um, at that means creating a protocol to m measure the way people interact with light switches or window shades or d window openings. Um, so that particular project, you know, he's, he actually has much less experience actually doing it than talking about it, because he's developing the framework. Um, uh, I, I did mention to some of you guys earlier, and, and we were going to do this in Milwaukee, we are using Wi-Fi data uh, for occupancy uh, tracking. So, so we off the Cisco routers, you can figure out not, a, a, not absolute counting, but relative counting. So we can figure out um, if the space is occupied or unoccupied. And is it, you know, if we, if we, if we have a, a 0 to 100, is it 50% occupied or 75%? And can we model occupancy based on sort of the Wi-Fi data? So, so uh, we also had a building at LBL where um, they were tracking, they had hourly water data. And it was uh, a 24-hour facility to support the advanced light source. And we realized there was no toilet flushing at night. So they changed the HVAC system and started turning it off at night because nobody was there. So this proxy mod modeling, monitoring of water or, or Wi-Fi is, is going to be an important um, example of you know, how you use. I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, uh, Target, well, some of the big box retail, they were monitoring CO2 for HVAC, and they realized where people are shopping, the CO2 levels were high. So they were using the CO2 to also track which areas were most active for shopping experiences. So you, you install it for HVAC, but you use it for something else. And that's one of the opportunities in the space. Any other questions? Are you getting any pushback on that? Use of the <coughs> that idea that it's yeah. you know. Uh, so ARPA-E just came out with a whole um, solicitation about occupant uh, monitoring. And um, we did respond to that. Um, UC Berkeley responded to We're actually competing directly with UC Berkeley in that one. We know that. Uh, we tried to team with them, but they're not always so easy to team. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of work on disguising the data. The, 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 the data that we were collecting with the Wi-Fi was simply um, counts. It, it wasn't even by room. Um, but the by room stuff, we definitely want. We were talking about in light. So some lighting systems uh, can, the, you know, it's one thing to measure. Uh, there can, you could have an occupancy center, but it's not a communicating occupancy sensor, right? So, so there's a lot of ways to start to measure uh, where people are in a building. And if you don't collect who they are, but just the counts, then, then in general, for, H, for what we're doing, it's fine. Um, it, and certainly for 
it, I know as, um, at Xerox Park they, they had badges and people would walk around, they'd know where everybody, people hated that. So, so you're right, if, if it's actually, I, if it's attributable to a single person, people don't like that. The reason I'm thinking about it is because your last thing there is education, outreach, and training, right? Thing. Yeah. And part of that is the conversation with the general public. Yeah. And yeah. as you're making that conversation about things like demand and response with the general public, yeah. first you have to overcome that basic lack of understanding about how systems work at all. Yeah. Yeah, a big brother, and, yeah. And whether people are thinking about how to position those conversations. Yes. Yeah. No, that, I, I think that, you know, so if you, that example that Johnson Controls thinks that they can sell energy management, I mean, this is, you know, it's 2017, it's about time they figure out that can sell that. Um, what does it take to do that? I, it's a, I think who your audience is and educating the audience is important, and, and it's a good question. I was just going to add, you mentioned the Comfy app yep. real quickly, which is a smartphone app that yep. interacts with the building system. And, um, those people have dealt with this issue a lot. Yep. It's, it, there's unique identifiers yep. and, and so forth, and they know where you are in the building and they actually control your zone. Yeah. But what I've heard on the flip side, they said a lot of the, the individuals that are using it take it for granted because we're all sharing our data and using apps all the time every day. Yeah. So that's one perspective. It's kind of we're in the modern age. Yeah. But then on the flip side, security and protecting that data in the database is their number one issue selling it and implementing it. If they go to a campus or a big owner, yeah. they want they want to know where that the data is secure. And that yeah. all, all of that private data of how when people said they were hot or cold will get out into the world. Right. Or when did you. how long were they at lunch? Yeah, exactly. I mean <laughs> it's definitely there's concerns with that data. Yeah. Have you uh, looked into uh, tackling zero net energy in existing building stock? Um normally we see fifty percent retrofits. We don't see zero that often. Um, there's probably a few out there, I have to think. I mean, I, I'm sure there are some. But, but it sort of depends on, you know, the HVAC retrofits are expensive. Um, and I know sometimes, sometimes you get rid of the HVAC and it, you, you, you know, expose the ceiling and try to do a radiant type systems. Uh, chill beams, I, I think, are doing actually pretty well. We've done some chill beams in Flex Lab. Um, uh, so zero, we're, I'm less concerned with zero. Uh, uh, but, you know, figuring out the retrofit agenda for commercial building retrofits or residential is, is definitely an issue. Uh, we did, Ian Walker, who's one of our residential guides, had a study once on, I think about a dozen 50% retrofit homes, and so he has a story on each one of them and what worked and what didn't. And, and so we, we are starting to see that. Of course, NBI has the, uh, you know, zero net energy commercial buildings, um, and they're all small. You know, that, that's, that's one thing. The bigger they, and more complex, the harder it is, for sure. It seems like one, as we move into a, a, a world with more and more control yeah. and dynamic pricing and all of that, yeah. building management becomes more complex. Yep. And um, for large commercial facilities, they can afford to have yep. building managers to engage with that, but mid-size yep. and smaller, I can see that as being a real challenge. Sure. Because it just it seems like one of the key challenges is figuring out how do you match up uh, the complexity of the controls in yes. order to achieve what we want with the capacity of the people that a business or a organization can afford to hire to, to manage that. Right. The, the good news is I think in smaller commercial you see more remote services being offered. So it may not be somebody on site but it may be somebody who's running it in the cloud and somebody's providing third-party services. So I actually think for homes in the long run, you may want that also. You may have a service contract for somebody to come in and retrofit your house and then give you a monitoring tool and they every month they tell you how you're doing or something. I mean, I, I think, I, we don't see that yet, but I think those service models, and you know, if you think about the training <coughs> and, and, and workforce development here, there's actually, those are good jobs to do this stuff. And, and so we haven't quite figured out what those jobs are. Uh, we do have a partnership with Laney College in Oakland 
and we work with um, uh, a community college in Milwaukee and one in Atlanta, and we're developing community college curricula for HVAC service technicians, and, and that uh, whatever these Energy Plus models, we, we get, taught them how to use it, it's all online, so, so we're trying to train the, you know, the community college professors, teachers, how to, how to talk about this stuff. We still have time. For yep. um, I know you've worked a lot in demand response uh -huh. in your career, and um, I was thinking about the question earlier about retrofitting existing buildings. One of the big vehicles, policy vehicles, we've used um, to incentivize retrofits are rebate programs, uh -huh. and we have that also for demand response. Uh -huh. Historically, there's been a split between uh -huh. the two. Yeah. Which a lot of people cite as a problem because yeah. once you get all the transaction costs of recruiting a building and deciding to do a retrofit and setting up systems, yeah. um, why don't you do everything you, you should do? Yeah. Or once you're in there, you should do efficiency, you should right. set up demand response, right. so you can take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what you, if you see some movement, and mm -hmm. particularly in California, for making it so that from a policy point of view, we'll try to do that in existing buildings. Yeah. And, and where, you know, what, at what point will we get what we want, which yeah. is uh, doing both at once yeah. for retrofits? So, so the, it, it, within the three investor-owned utilities, the person that has been most um, visionary about that has been Mark Martinez. He actually had uh, uh, PECI do uh, retro commissioning DR pilot. It doesn't mean they did it well. I don't think it worked well, but they tried. Um, uh, SMUD, when they incentivize uh, lighting controls or energy management systems, they require open ADR. Uh, they actually had 1.0 and 2.0 is harder. Uh, so that's, again, devil's in the details of these things. Um, we have been, of course, talking with the PUC. The study that Peter is the uh, lead author on um, definitely talks about that. If DR is just really expensive, so if you leverage it with EE, so, so the first thing to do is, when you do controls retrofit, require it. That doesn't mean they have to go into a program. So, so you can have, you can have the, the, this open ADR system is a, um, it's a, it's a client, or what's called an end node, and it, it can communicate this open ADR language. And we have open ADR 1.0, which we published in 2009, and then we have 2.0A and 2.0B. So we're just talking with the code people about what are they going to require in the next version of Title 24. And should they say 2.0 or 2.0A? Because 2.0B is too complex. They don't need to require that. So, so it, you know, it's inside baseball. It's like to require who to do what. And, uh, but in general, the state is the, 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 the utilities tell me, if the PUC tells us to do it, we'll do it. And then the, the, the PUC says, if the IOU is ask for it, we'll let them do it, sort of, you know. So, but they, neither of them go first, because they're not innovative. And, and so we do it in research pilots and say, you really should require this. So it takes a long time to get everybody to think about it. But it's, it, it, and it's mostly because the money for E and the money for DR are so siloed, the goals and the money, they don't, they don't have integrated DSM. So demand side management, energy efficiency is a billion dollars a year, demand responses. It's, it's much smaller, and their goals are complicated. So, so it'll happen, but it's, and, and they're thinking about it. So I think in the next couple of years, you'll start to see some of that. Any other questions? Thank you, speaker. Thank you.